everyone. Welcome to our advanced tutorials for Coco's Creator. If you have been playing any type of RPG or fighting game, you probably have seen this funny thing. This is a progress bar. The progress bar is used for either showing how close you are to achieving a goal, your health, your enemy's health, or a whole list of other things. There are three types of progress bar, the horizontal, vertical, and circular. In this tutorial, we're going to focus on the circular progress bar and share some information on using the sprite, button, and progress bar components in Coco's Creator. Here's an example given to us by a developer. It shows that if you hit the notes at the right times, you can fill up the bar and then can click on it to slow down time. Let's build our own version of that progress bar. Let's start by building some images for the progress bar that look very closely like the example as well as a button that we've used to increase the bar by 1% and 10% so we can test our work. So let's open up Coco's Creator and start building our scene. In Coco's Creator, I've already added my assets to the project bar, as you can see here. Now it's time to add them to the scene. I built these assets already, but any assets that is made from a PNG or JPEG will be fine. I'm adding these balls on top of each other to build the progress bar itself. It will make it look cool and more appealing. And our buttons will be duplicated, so we don't have to build two different types of buttons. Make sure that the assets are in the canvas hierarchy. Add the blue ball and the white ball into the canvas, and make sure the blue ball is above the white one. Now, let's increase the size of one of the circles, so that it looks similar to the example we showed earlier. Increase the blue ball to a reasonable size. I'm putting mine at three times the size. I'm also increasing the size of my white ball by two times. Let's move it a bit to the side so we can add the buttons. Now let's add two buttons and have one of the buttons a bit smaller so we can use the big one as the 1% increase and the smaller one as a 10% one. I'll use the stretching tools in Coco's Creator. Make sure the heights are the same. Now that we have the necessary items in our canvas to test this, let's check out how it looks in a simulated window. Now let's run it. As you can see, there's a problem. We don't have all of the canvas in the window. That is because I have my view as an iPhone. Let's close the window, find my canvas size, and go into the settings. Go into the preview run area, and change the simulator resolution size to match our canvas as well as make it a horizontal orientation. After that's done, save and let's try the simulation again. Now that we have it working, let's start preparing the progress bar. First, we need to click on the blue circle node and check the properties. You'll see under the basic properties, there's a node component called sprite. We all know this is there because all images will need to be a sprite in the game. Now, let's look at each part closely. First is the Atlas property. This is where you would add an index file for your images. Let's take a quick look at what an Atlas is. If you are building a 2D game, you could have multiple images that are built for the player, enemies, items, and other moving objects. Though you might think it would be easier to have them all as separate files, it's not. In fact, it can be a hassle on your CPU and increase the size of your game by a lot if you do that. So, many developers use an atlas. This allows you to have all the images in one file and an index file that tells the game where each image is on the atlas. 
You can learn more about this from our documentation on our website. Since this is just an example and we don't use atlases, we can skip this. It's not a necessary item. Next is the sprite frame. This tells us which sprite file we are using. Since we've added our circles into the scene, the circle's name is already in the sprite frame. We can edit the size of the frame by clicking on the edit button. Next is the type. These are the ways we render the image onto the canvas. We have five modes, simple, sliced, tiled, filled, and mesh. Each type has a few options. Simple is just how it looks when you added it to the canvas. Sliced allows you to stretch an image on certain axis without affecting the corners. I'll show you an example of how this is used. Here is a window for an RPG. If we ask the game to stretch the image to the size of the text, it could look like this. It's pretty awful. With Sliced, I can edit the image like this. This keeps the corners maintained, but the top and the bottom stretched on the X axis, and the left and the right on the Y axis and the middle on all axes. This allows me to build windows of all sizes. Tiled mode means that as you increase the size of the sprite, it will instead create a new copy of itself, like blocks you would see in a platformer game. Filled mode allows you to not show the entire image, and you can alter this with your code. We'll be using this for our progress bar, so we'll discuss it further in the tutorial. Finally, there's mesh mode which allows you to add meshes to your image if you build the image in an application called Texture Packer and includes the polygon algorithms. Now we render the size with size mode. There are three types. Trimmed means this asks you if you'd like the transparent part of your image to be part of the boundary box used for collision detection or just the visible areas. We don't have to worry about that in this demonstration, so let's skip it. Raw just places the image on the screen at the size you built it, and cannot be changed. Custom will place the item at the size we set it up at, or the default, but we can change the size before it's set into the screen. Next is the Source Blend Mode and Destination Blend Mode. This is used if you are blending your image with other images, like a color light shined on an object. We won't go into this in our tutorial, so just don't touch it for now. Let's go back and select Filled in our Type property. Your circle may have disappeared, but don't worry, change the fill range to 1 just for now. Let's look at these options. First is the fill type. This tells us how we fill in the image. We can choose to have the image filled on the screen horizontally, vertically, or radially. Our tutorial is about radial progression, so let's use that. Next is the fill circle. This tells us where our center is. We want it to be in the middle of the circle, so change the fill center to 0.5 on both the X and Y. With the fill start, it wants to know where we want the filled bar to begin. 0 means 0%, and 1 means 100%. When it's horizontal, the meter will go left to right. Vertical goes top to bottom. Radial goes counterclockwise. Fill range tells us what the final fill range or amount of the picture should be viewed. Just like fill start, it starts from 0 to 1. Next is material, and this just explains what type of material this sprite is. Currently, it's defaulted to one type, and that is a built-in 2D sprite. We also don't need to mess with these options, so let's just skip it. Now it's time to add another component to the properties. Since this is a progression bar, we need to add the progression bar property. Click the Add Component button and select the UI component area and click on the Progress Bar component. Here you can see they have five different options. The bar sprite is asking for the sprite that will be used as a progress bar. Since it will be the blue circle, let's drag it from the node tree and into the bar sprite. Next is the mode. We can choose from three options. Let's go with just the filled, just like in the sprite properties. Next is the total length of the progress bar. This is great for when you have enemies with different health. You can add the health to the length. For us, let's just keep it at 1. Progress means where are we percentage-wise at the start. This can be from 0 to 1, with 1 being 100%. Finally, there is reverse. 
This allows you to reverse the progress of the bar, so you can go right to left, down to up, or clockwise if you would like. We won't be needing this for our demo. Now, let's set up some of the properties for when we start up our demo. Change the fill start to 0.25, the fill range to 1, the total length to 1, and the progress to 1. Now, we need to build another component to help the code talk to the properties of the circle. Let's add a TypeScript and call it progress bar x. Let's enter the TypeScript and let's get to coding. Let's delete the top. Now, delete everything inside of it and rename this as progress bar x class. Let's add some properties for the progress bar and set things for default. This includes the from, to, duration, elapsed, and the percentage. You see here that we are going to call on tween. The tween allows us to easily and smoothly move from one animation to another. This will be used to make the progress bar look like it's growing quickly instead of jumping from one point to another. We'll place it at null for now. We won't be playing with any of these except the percentage, but you could change these for different timers in the game. Now we can start to do our loading actions. Start will tell us if we should stop updating the component after a certain length of time. So let's disable this. Next is the is done function that will tell us if your progress bar is full. Progress two will take your percentage to a location you want. Just make sure the number is between 0 and 1. We'll also call tween to help animate that percentage change. Now let's build the tween function so it can help us move the percentages to the correct position and make it look beautiful. Finally, we can now start to have the game update the graphics as the percentage grows, as well as the nodes in the progress bar x properties using the action function. We won't be toying with all of these functions, but you can play with them after you finish this tutorial. There, now let's make an update function. The update function will take the percentage at a set time period, and if the bar is complete, we'll make the update false, making so I can add and subtract from the progress bar. This is great for when you want some animation or attacks to happen that you don't want to be added to the progress bar. We also are making sure to check on the progress bar at certain times. If it's not full, it will tell the step function what the percentage is at the moment. The step function is called to tell the percentage bar where we are in and relay it back to the progress2 function. Now we can save this and we have our progress bar component ready to work from. Let's add progress bar x to the blue ball and add the blue ball node as the bar. Now, we now need to test if all of this works. With the two buttons, let's give each a button component. Now, let's look at the left button first. In the button component, there are a target. We won't be doing anything to this, so let's ignore this. We have a question of if it's interactable. Make sure that this is clicked. The next option is enable auto gray effect. This will gray out your button if enabled. We'll keep that unchecked. Transition tells you how the button will look when activated. This includes a color change, a sprite change, a scale or size change, or none. For us, let's change the scale. Let's set the duration as 0.1 seconds and the size of the zoom as 1.2. Next is the click events. This is telling us what function needs to be called and in what script. We only want one, so I type in one. Now we want to call a function that adds one point to the progression bar 
and another function for 10 points for the other button. We haven't really built the script to do that, so let's build a new TypeScript and name it test scene and start to build the functions. Let's clean up the code and start working on it. First, let's import the functions of the progress bar X into the TypeScript. Next, let's change the CC class as test scene and add some properties. First, the node bar, and then the percentage being zero. On load, we want it to just start when the game starts. Now, on update, let's add three functions. First, we add the click one per, then the click 10 per, and the click reset. Great, let's go back to our project and go to the canvas. We need to add the component test scene so that it makes effects globally in the node tree. So make sure to have the blue ball as the node bar. Now go back to the button and say that this is calling on the progress bar on the canvas. So we need to drag the canvas node on the CC node. Now change the script to test scene and the function to click on one. Now we have it set up that when you click on the button, it goes up 1%. Now let's go to the other button and do the same thing, but change it to click on 10. Now that we have that, we're pretty much done, but I forgot to add a reset button. So let's just add one from our node library. I'll just go to the library and drag it into the scene. Now let's add some text to the button that says reset. Let's click on the label node, go to the string area and write reset and fix the font size. We really don't have time to talk about all of these options, but if you want to learn more, click on the book on the side of the component to get more information from our documentation. Now, go back to the button and change the click events to one. Then let's give it the canvas node, then the test score script, and then the reset function as the click event. And we're done. Let's save this and test it out. First, I can reset the bar back to zero. Now, let's click on the left button. You can see it's growing one by one. Now, let's click on the right button. You can see it's growing by 10. Now, you've built a progress bar and a few functions. Now, go ahead and play around with this, and hopefully we'll see this in your next game. Thank you so much for watching this episode, and we hope to see you in the next one.